we've looked at the two different types of waves, longitudinal and transverse. We're now going to have a look at certain uh, properties or characteristics of those waves. You can see here we've got two graphs um, that we're going to notate. Um, first of all, before we do though, I just want to point out that when we're looking at graphs of motion of waves, uh, they show the displacement of the particles from the equilibrium position. So whether it's um, a longitudinal or a transverse wave, the graph will basically look the same. Uh, so this, these situations here that we're dealing with could either be uh, longitudinal or they could be transverse. Uh, before we start though, we um, need to just uh, notate what these axes are. So first of all on the horizontal axis, uh, on the first one we're going to have time. Uh, now these might look like different graphs but they actually do represent the same, uh, same motion of a particular wave. Um, and so we've got the displacement um, of particles, or more specifically the displacement of a single particle, uh, and down the bottom we've got the displacement of particles as well. So as I said, the, the graphs that we're looking at here are dealing with the particle displacement. Uh, the difference though is that uh, up the top we're only looking at one particle and how it moves with time. Down the bottom we're looking at how uh, particles along the wave are changing, and so this uh, axis here will actually be distance along the wave itself or distance along the medium. Uh, so you can think of it as being the top graph shows one particle at various times. So each of the, the points in time that we might record as we move along uh, throughout time, uh, that shows us what the displacement of the particle is. Whereas down the bottom, it shows us lots of particles, but at only one time uh, or one particular time. So if we wanted to see what would happen with all of those particles at a different point in time, we'd need another graph showing displacement versus distance. Um, now, I mentioned before about these graphs not really having a distinction between transverse and longitudinal. In order to distinguish between them, what you'd basically need to do is identify what that means and what that means. For the case of a transverse wave, uh, that would be up and that would be down. But in the case of a longitudinal wave, uh, up might be, say, to the right, and down here might be to the left. So still just looking at the displacement of the particle from its equilibrium position. So as I said, uh, these graphs could represent either transverse or longitudinal waves. Now, as we go through, I'm just going to notate what the, um, the particular uh, properties or characteristics or quantities are that we need to be aware of. Uh, and then we'll describe them in more detail uh, underneath the graphs. So the first thing is uh, the this uh, uh, quantity here, which is known as the amplitude, has a symbol capital A. Um, and you'll notice that on both graphs they have the same amplitude because they're representing the same uh, wave. So that displacement of the particle from its equilibrium position will be the same. Uh, the next one to have a look at up the top, you'll notice that we're uh, sort of identifying uh, two consecutive points on the wave that are doing the same thing. So from a peak to a peak, we could also do from a trough to a trough. We could likewise do from uh, a zero crossing where it's, in this case, it's going down uh, through the equilibrium position. And so we could notate that um, distance there as well, or that um, time, I should say. Uh, the symbol that we give that, that's the period with a capital T. Uh, down the bottom, we have a similar quantity that we need to look at, but instead of being uh, related to time, it's now related to distance. So we're looking for that distance there. Uh, that's lambda, uh, which is the wavelength. So we'll jot down what each of those mean and uh, give a, a bit more context to what those quantities are. But ultimately, uh, the ones that we're most interested in, amplitude, period, and wavelength. And there's a couple of others that tie into those as well. So first of all, amplitude. Uh, the easiest way to consider amplitude uh, is that it is the... Um, the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position, the maximum displacement of a particle from its equilibrium position. Um, now you could, um, uh, you might sort of think, well, do we deal with it going up or going down? Uh, amplitude is generally, you sort of consider it to be the positive uh, uh, amount. Um, and so usually you'd go from set the equilibrium position to its maximum. In some cases, um, it's easier to consider what the top and bottom is. So if we've got, a, say, the heights of tides, for example, uh, it might be easier to identify that that might be, say, 12 metres, and this might be, say, 10 metres. So you know that the uh, equilibrium position in there is going to be halfway between them, so it's got to be 11. 
Uh, but in that case, if we don't really care about the equilibrium position, we can take the maximum displacements, divide by 2, uh, so the difference there being 2, so that means that the amplitude in that case would be 1 metre. Uh, so just something to keep in the back of your mind. While the amplitude is measured from the equilibrium position, uh, there are a few different ways that you can um, identify what the amplitude is. Usually uh, amplitude will be measured in metres, given that it is a distance uh, or a displacement, but um, we can't always define it that way, so it depends on the scenario. Uh, the second property that um, I want to look at now is the wavelength. It's probably the, the next easiest to make sense of. The letter that we use there is the Greek letter lambda, um, and wavelength, as the name suggests, it's a distance or a length uh, over which the wave repeats itself. So uh, that could be that we're looking from one peak to the next peak. Um, it could be that we're looking from one trough to the next trough. Uh, it doesn't really matter what point on the wave it is that you're observing. You're just looking at the fact that the, um, or even a compression to a compression in a longitudinal wave, uh, you're looking for that repeating uh, pattern of the, uh, the distance between those two things. Uh, the next one then that's similar but slightly different is the period and period is not just the, it's not the distance now, it's the time over which the wave repeats itself. So with distance it's literally like you'd sort of grab a ruler and measure how far uh, the uh, it is between um, adjacent peaks. Uh, with um, period you need to sort of grab a stopwatch, look at a particular point in space and time from the passing of one peak to the passing of the next peak. Um, now generally speaking time uh, is measured, the uh, SI units for time are uh, seconds uh, and so uh, period would usually be measured in seconds. Now there's another quantity that you can't really represent graphically uh, but something that's useful uh, in order to quantify a wave and that's frequency. Now frequency um, it's a little bit harder to, um, to, to measure uh, you usually sort of need something to do with period in order to figure it out. Uh, but you can think of frequency as how often a wave repeats itself in a given time period. So the way that I like to describe these um, is to sort of, is, there's a very clear link between period and frequency. Um, so if you think about period, the other way to think about it is that it's the number of seconds per cycle. So how many seconds does it take for one cycle to be completed? Whereas frequency, basically just going to reverse those two, it's the number of cycles per second. So they're very, uh, very clearly linked. Um, and you can see there that it's literally just sort of finding the, the uh, inverse and that leads to the equation then for frequency compared to period uh, f being equal to 1 on t. Now that one is an important one so I'm going to highlight it, uh, it's in the, uh, the um, data booklet and so f is equal to 1 on t. In this case we'd usually have um, time measured in seconds and frequency then, uh, note that we're saying that it's cycles per second if we're talking about cycles, we're literally just counting. There's no measurement there, it's just how many, whether it's one, two, three, or four, or uh, some fraction of that, or some uh, ridiculously large number. Um, so frequency is measured in um, per second, but we usually relabel that uh, to the, the units of hertz. So if you hear the frequency stated in hertz, it really just means the number of cycles per second. Um, so this is the unit that we're going to more uh, commonly see, uh, but keep in the back of your mind that it basically just means the same as uh, per second. The last quantity that we need to deal with is actually um, easier to start off by looking at um, the wave equation itself um, rather than just stating what it is. Um, so with the wave equation, um, if we're looking at a longitudinal or a transverse wave, um, a peak or a um, compression region um, travels along through the medium. So we, we saw that in the previous video that um, as the, uh, the wave is travelling we can follow a, a peak or a trough uh, or a compression or a rarefaction 
and we can see that that actually travels through the medium. And if it's traveling through the medium, we can then measure how far it's traveled, um, or and we can time how long it takes to travel that distance. Um, so that means we can calculate the, uh, the wave speed. So that's the, uh, the last quantity that we need to look at is the wave speed itself. Uh, now wave speed is uh, most easily calculated by considering the distance, as I said, that the, uh, the peak or the compression travels and the time that it takes to travel that distance. Generally speaking though, if we're dealing with waves, we're not worrying about a, a, any sort of random distance. We've got a distance that we can refer to being the wavelength. So if we know what the wavelength is, so the time that, sorry, the distance over which a wave repeats itself, and we compare that to the time over which the wave repeats itself, we can then calculate what the wave speed is. Notice that wavelength would usually be measured in meters, and period would usually be measured in seconds, and so we end up with that, um, the wave speed being measured in meters per second. So just a little side note there for the, uh, about the units. Um, however, in this particular case, um, we are probably not usually going to use the, the period. It's not so much a period that would be useful, particularly when you consider, say, the frequency of uh, sound waves. Uh, it's really quite high, so trying to measure the period of a sound wave, um, even just as I'm talking now, the frequency of my voice would be somewhere in the, the hundreds of hertz, so 200 to 400 sort of uh, range. Um, and so that means that the period is very, very short. So instead of using period, we're going to use uh, frequency. And we know that F is equal to 1 over uh, T. You can see that we've already got that divide by T here. So we can then just substitute in, instead of writing 1 over T, we can write that equation as V is equal to F lambda. So frequency multiplied by the uh, wavelength. That uh, is the wave equation. So um, fairly easy one to calculate. Um, so in this case, V is the wave speed, and that will be in meters per second. Uh, F is the frequency in hertz, and again, just a reminder, frequency in hertz really means that it's a uh, number of cycles per second, and lambda is the wavelength in meters. Uh, now, if we look at a particular medium, um, so let's say we're looking at air, and for a given medium, V will be constant. So the wave speed is constant. Now, we can vary that speed. So in air, for example, we can uh, heat the air, and that'll mean that the speed increases. But if we consider it at a set temperature and we sort of keep everything the same, then the speed's going to be constant. Uh, so that means if the frequency increases, the wavelength will decrease. Um, and so basically we're then looking at this situation, if we rearrange that equation, we're really saying F is equal to uh, V over lambda, and if we sort of separate that out even more to make it even clearer, we've got V being a constant multiplied by 1 on lambda. So here's our um, one variable, here's the other variable we're dealing with with a constant in between them. So what we can say from that then is that um, F is inversely proportional to the wavelength. Um, so that means that um, uh, if we change one, if we increase one, the other will decrease. Uh, an ex example of that, as I mentioned, is um, sound. If we increase the frequency of sound, that means that the sound waves are going to be have a shorter wavelength because they'll still be moving at the same speed through the medium. Uh, there are other proportional relationships we can look at here, but we'll leave that for later um, because there's one in particular that will tie into uh, the concept of refraction that will make it a little bit easier to talk about uh, in that video.